Hello, everybody. Um, as you all know, we're here to talk about the infinitely exciting um, subject um, of commercial applications of AI. And um, even though this is a particular lens on AI, it's still a very wide-ranging and deep subject that gets more and more important by the day. So I'm actually going to have all of us um, sort of introduce ourselves and talk about what uh, commercial AI means in each of our worlds. And I'm actually going to kick things off. Uh, so first of all, um, I actually have a personal obsession with AI. Uh, to the extent that even though my name is Natalie Monbio, people like friends and colleagues are starting to call me um, Natalie Monbot. <laughs> uh, it's a little trend that's gaining traction. But um, on a more serious note, um, when it comes to marketing, um, AI is really um, starting to revolutionize um, the way that consumers and brands, and particularly brands, can engage with consumers. And we're basically entering, AI is helping us to enter the holy grail of marketing, where we can actually have as brands, um, emotional one-to-one -one, uh, relationships with consumers at scale. And some early experiments um, with AI uh, and messaging um, have really started to show us the potential um, of, of, of what AI can do for marketing. So that's my little intro. Babak, would you like to um, tell us your interpretation of commercial AI? <laughs> sure. I am the uh, co-founder and chief scientist at Sentient Technologies. And um, we solve the world's toughest problems using distributed AI. And so commercial applications of AI, we think of ourselves as a product company. It's front and center of what we do. And it may sound surprising, but not all AI companies are about commercial applications of AI. Um, and so we do operate in uh, e-commerce space, uh, uh, user experience, and as well as uh, trading. OK, great. Douglas, can you tell us a little bit about what you're up to? I can. So uh, whenever there's a close-up shot of me on TV, I'm struck by the bizarrely large head that I have. <laughs> uh, so I'm the CEO and founder of Zest Finance. We use machine learning to try and repair underwriting. Underwriting for credit in the United States and China, which are our two markets, uh, has fundamentally not progressed since the 1970s. Uh, despite the fact that there is basically infinite data available, infinite computation, and free and infinite storage. And what we've done is applied the kind of the, the, the big data mathematics that's been built by various companies, uh, particularly in the Valley, particularly places like Google, to try and find a way to provide fair and transparent credit to people who currently are locked into the system by the failures of, of FICO and current underwriting. Mm -hmm. So what would you say, like, why is um, AI important now? Like, what, what, are you, what problem are you solving for there? 40% of Americans have uh, quite fraught interactions with their banks, and 25% of Americans have no access to, to traditional credit at all. Uh, many of those 25% are you know, perfectly good humans. Uh, they're not drug dealers, they're, not, uh, they're, they're, they're people with jobs. What they are is they either have bad credit or no credit. Um, the problem with that, it, it, the reason they have bad credit or no credit in part is because of the mathematics used to, to assign the credit score. But actually, what you're, not, you're trying to do is not assign a score when you're making a loan. You're trying to provide life certainty. And to provide life certainty, what you need to understand is what that person is going to do. What, are they going to repay you? Do they want to repay you? Would they repay you if you can? Those are fundamental AI questions, uh, obviously proxied by math. But they're AI questions. And that's what we view as modern AI. OK, nice. So kind of doing, it's doing a public service, AI helping to do a public service at the same time as the com commercial aspect of obviously making money out of it at the end of the day. I certainly hope so. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, and Rana, would you like to address that question? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Rana Al-Kayubi. I'm co-founder and chief science and strategy officer at Affectiva. And we're all about emotion AI. So our vision is to bring emotional intelligence into AI systems that we like to say are have very high IQ, but absolutely no EQ. Mm. Um, the applications of this um, range from media and advertising to um, incorporating emotion sensing and emotion analytics into healthcare and education and automotive. There's a, there's a wide range of, of uh, areas where we can uh, activate this emotional intelligence in AI. Yeah, so we were talking um, yesterday. It's quite interesting in, in the early testing that I mentioned that we were doing um, in AI and um, sort of AI bots within messaging. Um, we actually did a pilot for Sony Pictures where we turned uh, the main character in the Goosebumps movie 
Slappy into an AI agent, um, and consumers and fans could basically engage with Slappy in Messenger. And uh, we found that the emotional connection to be absolutely massive and you know, quite astounding at times. Uh, in one case, um, uh, someone asked Slappy to wish them luck in a chemo appointment. Uh, and so we were talking. That's fascinating. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. So, like, okay, so that's without. In, you know, Slappy has a personality, and right. so people want to engage with that personality. And of course, brands, that's the kind of emotional engagement that brands seek to have with their consumers. Right. But what do you think in terms of, feel like, so we're starting to feel like there was a lot of responsibility that brands are now taking on. You know, great, we managed to strike up an emotional connection, right. but do we really want that um, responsibility of, you know, people kind of really relying on brand personas like that? Do you have any thoughts on? Yeah, absolutely. So obviously, emotions are very are very personal to people. And as you as you said, if we start building these very emotionally engaging experiences that can respond to your you know emotional state in real time. So what we do is we provide people with the ability to incorporate technology that can sense your emotional state through your face and also through your voice. And what what this means is that you can craft the experience to to really strengthen this emotional connection and. Uh, we, we talk a lot about, you know, what, what kind of responsibility does that place on the designer of the experience? How do you incorporate empathy into, into that AI, you know, into this AI system? You could imagine, you know, personal assistants like Siri or, you know, Amazon's Alexa or Cortana, like a lot of these, or even social robots that are going to be at our, in our homes. Um, there is a responsibility to build um, empathy and, and also rapport and trust through mm -hmm. the, so the kinds of technologies that we build. And I, and I think there needs to be more dialogue around, you, you know, what are the lines and, and what are the kind of guidelines in designing these types of systems. Yeah. So it sounds like, um, implicitly from what you're saying, um, that humans will have quite a big role in defining what um, commercial AI ends up being mm -hmm. and how it evolves. So, Babak, have you got some thoughts on specifically what the skill sets and what the roles of those people, those real people, will be? Well, the most popular job these days is data science. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And uh, good data scientists are hard to come by. Uh, and uh, it, absolutely, the fact is that uh, I think I don't really distinguish between AI and technology when it comes to you know the human's role. Mm -hmm. uh, we're always kind of elevating our own role um, as we have uh, you know our tools essentially doing more and more of what we either can't do or is very difficult for us to do. Mm -hmm. So I think AI falls in the same category uh, yeah. as that. Okay, nice. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I read some stuff um, that you wrote a little while ago in Forbes about, um, and not specific to AI, but the importance of hiring for diversity. Um, and to what extent is that, you know, is that an important thing as we head to a world of greater and greater commercial AI? I, I hope we're headed to a world of greater and greater commercial AI. So, um, can you send me out to Google for a yeah. second. There were, uh, obviously Google is famous for being completely automated and, you know, like, et cetera. But there actually were a group of people who were called quality raters. And what they did is they would uh, look at, uh, look at re re result sets uh, and try to do a various set of measures. Happiness at three was the likelihood you'd get the right answer at three. You know, happiness at seven, et cetera. And we would compare our results to other people. It, it, it was a way of understanding how well we were doing. And that was an input to the training. So even though we were an automated delivery shop and a large automated training shop, there's still people. Mm. Uh, and I think the last 30 years of, of AI have, I think, demonstrated pretty compelling that the machines are not actually going to go do things on their own without a bunch of help for a long time. So then that, that begs the question that you asked. I think, well, what does that help have to look like? Um, we believe, as a matter of, of sort of not, of, a matter of, of, of faith, not just about AI, that you get better answers to the extent you get different kinds of people attacking the same way, the same problem, uh, because they'll attack it all in their own way. You have to build some infrastructure for that to be true. You have to let people be safe. You have to let people be honest. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff you have to build. It's not enough to just drop people in a room. But part of the reason that we've gotten to uh, unusually good results in, in FinTech is because uh, although I have a data science team, I think only one of them has a degree in data science. Right? I've got, got psychology people. You've got computer science, you've got mathematicians, you've got a couple of computational geneticists. I mean, like, and they all show up with different mathematics and different view of the world and different questions to ask. And I think as a result, our solutions are far more robust. And that robustness 
is what has historically been lacking in traditional AI, which was needle-thin quality, but inside that needle, you got you know, unexplicable results. And I think that's the breakthrough that we in AI have had in the last five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. Um, so kind of related to that, do you think that we, as we kind of move into this world of more commercial AI, is it going to be a case of AI-assisted humans, human-assisted AI? Like, what kind of combination do you see panning out? I don't know. So I, first of all, I'll just say I don't see it as human versus machine. I mm -hmm. think there is a partnership. Yeah. Um, certainly in, in our work where we're training algorithms to read people's emotional states, it's definitely a combination of, of human machine you know, working together. Uh, we often use the algorithms and the deep learning networks to bootstrap some of the emotions that we're looking mm -hmm. for. And then we use expert human coders to give feedback to the machine and it's a loop. Yeah. And, and I, I think you can project that into the future. I think we're going to see more yeah. of that partnership. So it's a lot of augmenting human abilities. Yeah. Um, another example is uh, we do a lot of work with autism, mm -hmm. with individuals on the autism spectrum. And, you can Im and, and a lot of these people have trouble reading um, other people's social cues. So you could imagine like a Google Glass that can give real-time feedback to these individuals. And it really augments their social and emotional capabilities. Um, so. Yeah, so we see it as more of an augmentation and a partnership. That's interesting. Um, so there's a lot of AI can be applied commercially to do good. Um, but there does feel like there's some kind of like um, conflict in the words, some kind of something potentially slightly sinister when you think about commercial AI, especially when we're talking about people's emotions and we're talking about using AI to generate more empathy but ultimately, it is for commercial gain. So how, how do those two things kind of sit together? Anybody? Back back. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, again, replace AI with technology in that question. Uh, yep. Why not use technology for commercial gain? I mean, it's uh, capitalism. Um, and, uh, and oftentimes, uh, you know, we extend ourselves using AI. I mean, in, in our e-commerce application, for example, uh, we tried using human-generated tags for uh, what we were trying to sell in the, in the UI, and they weren't as good as the AI uh, discovered mm -hmm. tags that distinguish between the merchandise. Um, and simply because it seems like, for example, deep learning does mimic the way we see things and we observe the world, and so it's a better extension yep. than you know, us semantically going and tagging these things. So we had a little discussion with Doug in the, uh, with Douglas in the uh, uh, backstage uh, about that. That doesn't mean that semantics and human-generated uh, terminology and morphology is not useful, but, uh, but in some cases, you know, our AI can predict our preferences better than uh, ourselves, even. And it's surprising in a delightful way. Yeah, so I, I tried their product, and it was, uh, I was looking for a boot. <laughs> And it was actually, it was a great user experience and it's more efficient and, you know, it, I, I was able to converge on something that I really like in a shorter period of time. Yeah. So I think you're providing a more engaging user experience and you're helping people be more productive. So mm -hmm. I, I think there is a way to be helpful with, with the commercial AI system. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, it's the, I think the question is a great, a great question and obviously with, you know, there's a lot of historical context, right? So the notion that you can separate AI from technology, you know, go back to, let's go back to the simple things about the Industrial Revolution. Uh, we all think about the Jacquard loom as being the important technology automation thing that, that drove the Industrial Revolution, but the Luddites were not excited by the Jacquard loom. The Luddites were excited by the fact that there was a loom. So it's, um, it's really easy for us, because of how we view the world, to see the AI, the mathematics, as the lever that matters, when in fact it, it is just the fact that change causes disruption. And you kind of can't argue anything else. Sometimes a change causes good disruption. So for example, there's probably no one in this room who drives a car that does not have anti-lock brakes. Um, and yet, uh, in the early 80s to late 80s, there was a lot of movement to ban anti-lock brakes because they, had, they, were, they got you farther away from the road as the driver. Obviously, that's you know, was wrong-headed, and that's an example of AI that has saved millions of lives uh, and was, un was unpopular. I think. So there's a hundred examples, I think, of what all of us have talked about, where AI clearly makes your life better, but it is incumbent on us, it's incumbent on all of you in the audience to think through the fact that change always hurts someone. And what do we as a society 
and what do we as people who are making healthy profits off of AI uh, owe to the world to help those people who have been displaced by the technology that we build and sell? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's a question that we don't tend to ask mm -hmm. very often because it's extraordinarily uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that doesn't make it wrong. Yeah. So to what extent do you think that we need to be transparent about when AI is in play? Um, I'll start off with an example which I thought was really interesting where, uh, so a company, a, a startup that we work with, um, basically uh, turned kind of celebrities into AI bots and did an experiment and then How did revealed, they tell the what's that? How did they tell the difference? Well, exactly. <laughs> so the consumer didn't know that it was an AI bot and then was told it was one and wasn't particularly surprised, so there isn't much difference to an answer to your question. But the, the thing that was interesting about that is they were actually relieved to discover that it was a bot, an AI bot, as opposed to the real celebrity. And this kind of like goes back to kind of people, how comfortable people are talking to machines in the sense of if you think about people do, you know, typing out a search query in Google, people are prepared to ask Google things that they would never ask a real person. Yeah. So I just wonder how you guys think that will play out in terms of these kind of AI driven personas and you know, how, you know, maybe we should be as transparent as possible because people will be more forthcoming and, um, and that will be a more honest relationship. I'd love to get. So, so I think there's a huge opportunity to leverage the way people just confide in technology. We, we've seen examples where, you know, with avatar nurses and clinicians, avatar clinicians, people are more forthcoming about, you know, disclosing that they have depression or that they're suicidal in a way that they would not do with friends and family or their doctors. So I think they're... You know, again, again, it's a two-sided, you know, it's two sorted it's a two-sided kind of whatever, <laughs> um, <laughs> tricky, right? Because, yeah. because now this avatar may know that you have depression, and, and, and does, it, does it disclose this to your doctor? Does it yeah. tell your mom? Does it tell your partner? Yeah. Um, so we, we, there's definitely a lot of ethical questions around this, but the opportunity to leverage the fact that a lot of people are, you know, that are, are married to their devices and are intimate with their devices in a way that can really be helpful. Mm -hmm. I would argue that uh, the presence of the persona itself does uh, motivate users to use the system more. Uh, that's the case with Siri as well, even though the persona of Siri is really not the AI. It's a lot yeah. of like canned messages, yep. you know, meaning of life or tell me a joke. But that's what makes it delightful and pleasant. People know that Siri is not a person, yeah. but they forget. Yeah. And I think it's critical and important. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, in the case of um, Slappy, I don't know what's around. actually I'm not going to tell you about that. But do join um, our roundtable discussion at 3 p.m. if you would like to continue um, talking about this and ask any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.